Hello everyone, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you may be tuning in, and welcome to today's event on how the UK can encourage the uptake of AI in the public sector. My name is Aisha Bassi, and I'm a policy analyst at the Centre for Data Innovation, a pro-innovation think tank where I focus on UK and EU digital policy. Today's topic is an exciting one. The private sector is absolutely teeming with AI opportunity. We've all seen the impressive outputs generated by ChatGPT, but AI is also being used to support things like drug discovery, reviewing legal contracts, and also detecting cases of fraud. And the opportunities are growing. According to Crunchbase, generative AI and AI-related startups raised nearly $50 billion in 2023. So the question is, how can we tap into this market to better support the public sector? Today's discussion will explore this question in depth. Now, before we begin, I just want to say that today's event is very much an open conversation. So for those in attendance, we encourage you to submit questions for the speakers via the Slido link that can be found in the YouTube description or on the event webpage. You are also encouraged to share your thoughts on what is discussed today on X or other social media using the hashtag data innovation. So let's get started. We have some great panelists lined up for you today. First, we have Georgina Marathaftis. Georgina works with suppliers that are active or looking to break into the public sector market, as well as with local public services to create the conditions for meaningful transformation. She helps councils to understand what the art of the possible is when it comes to technology and innovation. Next, we have Dr. Cosmina Dorabantu, who is co-director and co-founder of the Public Policy Programme at the Alan Turing Institute, the UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI. With a team of 55 plus full-time academics, the programme is one of the largest research programmes in the world, working on data science and AI for the public sector. And finally, we have Dave Rogers, who is a partner at Public Digital, a growing consulting practice, practice with a global reach, which advises and supports institutions around tech, design, and organizational change. Dave's a former CTO, CDO, and software developer in media and the public sector. Thank you all so much for being here today. Um, I'll start with a broad question just to kickstart the discussion and set the scene, so to speak. And maybe each of you can share your thoughts on this. So starting with Cosmina, what is your impression of the current state of the public sector in actually using AI? Hmm. No, thank you so, so much for uh, for having us and what an exciting topic to be, uh, to be talking about. Um, Look, I mean, I think the good news is that AI systems are already in use within the public sector. Um, and at the Alan Turing Institute, we recently conducted a survey of 938 public sector professionals within the UK, covering education, health, social work, and emergency services. And we asked the survey respondents to what extent they use generative AI, decision support AI, and perceptive AI. And uh, if I could, I just give a little bit of a flavor for what we found. So generative AI are systems which can create text or images on the user's behalf. Um, and an example here would be using, you know, chat GPT to draft an email response. And our survey results showed that the use of generative AI systems within the public sector is already widespread. 45% of the respondents were aware of generative AI um, within their area of work, while 22% actively use a Gen AI system. Now, decision support AI in our survey refers to systems where machines are able to support decision making by predicting, recommending, or prioritizing outputs based on a set of inputs. Sort of an example here would be the use of AI in hospitals to help triage patients arriving in the emergency room based on the symptoms they present. And here, 9.8% of our survey respondents said they use decision support AI. And finally, for perceptive AI, which refers to systems where machines are able to process sensory information, such as visual and auditory inputs, um, and an example here is computer vision technology to assess whether an applicant's photo meets the criteria for a passport. And here, 8.5% of our survey respondents said they use perceptive AI in their work. So these are very encouraging figures and hot off the press. We've just released this report. Um, and we're not talking about some hypothetical potential here. You know, for some of these technologies, such as Gen AI, we're well into double digits when it comes to the percentage of public sector employees using them. I think that's a really exciting time. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's fantastic. Um, Dave, do you have any thoughts you'd like to add to that? Yeah, definitely. So I think um, so. So, so my 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 kind of work and my experience is kind of uh, at the moment is going into different clients, some public, some private sector, and kind of understanding the different challenges that they're that they're facing or opportunities they're facing. Um, I think. I think there's a I think there's a real kind of patchwork of a different levels of maturity, um, different levels of kind of self awareness of that maturity. Um, so you'll have you'll have some people who kind of maybe are, are perceiving that they are um, uh, very very kind of progressed in AI, but it's actually partly because they don't have a kind of full recognition of quite how deep the technology goes, quite how complex it get, it can become as you do more and more of it inside your organization. Um, because you can actually get, you can get very exciting results almost directly from commercial products um, at the moment. And that can give you a, a real sense of what's possible with AI, but it represents quite a kind of low level of depth of maturity of use of AI. Um, I think, I think I'd also describe the landscape at the moment as it's typically very experimental. There's lots and lots of uh, experiments going on. People are trying to learn how to use this technology. They're trying to apply it to real problems within their, within their spaces. To say that they've actually fundamentally realized a different way of achieving value within their organization with this new technology, I think those, those cases are actually quite rare uh, and they're actually probably also quite hard to prove. You're also often talking about kind of quite complicated counter narratives about the, the use of AI and the, the non-use of AI. Um, I'd also say a key part of the landscape at the moment is this, uh, this is not my expression, but there's quite a lot of FOMO out there. People, people are quite worried about not using AI and not keeping up with AI. And that that is actually driving a lot of kind of people's behaviors, like maybe like more reactive, more kind of like, you know, uh, ring fencing and targeting investment towards AI without maybe the, the typical kind of rigor and focus and strategy that you might see in other, other kind of areas of technology investment. So that would be my, that'd be a, uh, yeah, my, my view at this point. No, that was great. And Georgina, I can see you're nodding your head. It'd be great <laughs> to hear uh, your two cents on this as well. Absolutely. I don't know if Dave and I were speaking to the same person, but absolutely similar things that what we've been hearing, especially that we've definitely gone beyond the, the hype of AI. And we're hearing from a lot of um, kind of digital leads that we speak to that there's, I think there's a lot of interest from elected officials, senior leaders, CEOs at local government level asking their you know their teams what are you doing with AI so I think there is that pressure to prove you know that they are doing something around it so which is very different to other I would say kind of you know typical digital transformation projects so there's definitely the appetite and interest there which is backed up by kind of because Mina's uh, data so really interesting and really encouraging or definitely kind of um, read that report but also I think what um, Dave mentions, I think there's still an opportunity to scale that up. We're still seeing a lot happening at that pilot stage, which is something always kind of like a big challenge at local government level. We see lots of pilots, but actually, how do we embed that? How do we grow um, and scale that up? But also, when we talk about um, AI, I often I feel like it's like when we were having those discussions around data, it can mean so many different things. Obviously, the, kind of the last year, the big buzz was around generative um, AI, people were using that in their day-to-day -day lives, bringing that into work. So I think that was that added pressure that actually we need to work quick in terms of what is that guy, uh, what is the guidance, what is that user case for us as an organisation to use that. But, you know, a few years ago, we saw lots of councils use chatbots, and that's something that we see across different um, organisations. So I guess it, you know, guess what does it mean when we talk about kind of what a you know what type of AI kind of technology but I guess ultimately comes back to you know to the user case which I know I'm sure we'll discuss um, later on in the, the discussion today. Yeah no absolutely um, and actually staying with you Georgina I know that from my own research what I've seen is that local government in particular is still quite behind in the use of of AI, particularly with things like predictive analytics that might be derived from a, a fear of not knowing 
where the data is coming from or whether they're infringing on any privacy or security issues. Um, so I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate on any specific challenges that you see in implementing AI solutions at local government level and how you think we can overcome them. Yeah, no, that's an interesting point around predictive um, analytics. I think just going back to that, um, I think often councils are overwhelmed by the data that they actually have and, you know, how to use it. Is it the right kind of quality uh, data? But I think there's also that fear of them being the first, especially when you look at language like predictive analytics you know, often councils will end up on a tabloid front page for it. And, you know, it's the questions around, you know, is it, you know, ethical to intervene early? So I think there's those kind of bigger ethical questions um, that should be asked as well as actually kind of what are the opportunities that, you know, they bring. And I think that's really the chance to bring, you know, citizens, residents, the public on that journey to help them kind of demystify what these technologies uh you know or the data what it's there um what it's there to do so i think there is that kind of you know that challenge and the the fear about kind of being first um and the risk aversion um around that but i would say there are definitely kind of pockets of excellence across um you know local government and recognizing you know to manage demand they have to rethink processes and how they do do things and kind of one aspect of that is you know the better use of data and technologies yeah great um and taking a slight segue here um dave i know that funding can be such a barrier to ai adoption both from a resource perspective but also from a skills perspective and actually teaching people how to use ai um so i'd be curious to hear your thoughts on how we could fund ai opportunities in the public sector yeah, I think there's, I mean, it's something really interesting about, about the, um, uh, if, if AI at the moment is, is kind of in that experimental phase, um, that creates, almost creates quite an immediate challenge for the public sector. So a lot of public money is, is governed by, uh, rightly by kind of very strict procedures, very kind of, uh, formalized understandings of how public money should be spent. And, Generally speaking, that tends to discourage uh, innovation. It tends to discourage the idea that you might be taking a risk with public money. Um, in fact, if you if you look at things like the structure of uh, the Treasury's Green Book, it, it really kind of like structurally discourages the idea that you might be putting money into something where the return on investment is not necessarily there. Now, the contradiction that creates is you, you can't simply outsource all innovation to academia or the industry. I, I, I believe very strongly that government needs to be an innovator just, just as much as any other sector. Um, we, but it means really un, unstitching and unpicking quite a lot of historic institutional infrastructure around how funding works in the public sector. Um, now, I think what's also interesting is that these challenges that I'm describing now, they very much emerged through the introduction of um, simplistically agile uh, in, a, in a kind of more in a broader kind of more um, welcoming terminology we, we talk a lot more about test and learn but the, the way in which kind of major new pieces of government infrastructure like gov.uk and in the uk or um, universal credit in the uk they, they both emerge through agile methodologies through test and learn approaches which themselves struggle to get funding structures to um, to kind of match the way in which they genuinely were taking uh, risk for the introduction of certain technologies and certain service designs. So in that sense, AI kind of sits on top of a number of things that have happened historically that have shared those same challenges, but perhaps it becomes increasingly acute with AI. Um, I think you really do have to take a certain amount of risk to be able to try and see where the value is with that technology. Yeah, and, and to be honest, it's interesting because obviously the government recently announced this announced this public sector productivity program, which is, is going to try and use AI as part of that. But if they don't necessarily have the appetite to actually explore it, then uh, I don't really know how it's going to enhance productivity that much. Um, and actually going on from that, I know that the um, COSMINA, the, the Alan Turing Institute, does have that AI for bureaucratic productivity paper. Um, and I think that they found that 143 million transactions occurred within central government, of which 80% 
are highly automatable, which is amazing. Um, so it'd be great to hear what you think of those findings a little bit more. I know you kind of alluded to that earlier and also how you think that that will impact budget reallocation where AI does actually enhance productivity and potentially even reduces physical headcount. Yeah, um, so look, you know, we we thought about this a lot. Um, I've been thinking about this for, for more than six years, you know, um, how can we get government to, to take advantage of the latest generation of data intensive technologies? Um, and it is true that there's currently considerable excitement within government about the potential of AI to improve public sector service productivity. Um, now, what we sort of thought about um, is they usually have, when we talk about AI use in the public sector, we go straight to sort of like big things like, uh, like predictive policing or using machine learning for children's social care. And those are really sort of thorny issues, issues and very, very, very difficult systems to build. I'm not saying that, you know, there isn't potential there, but I think, you know, that is a massive sort of un undertaking. But so what we thought about is, OK, you know, if there is this risk averse um, culture within government, um, what can AI do that is sort of, you know, helping in the back office, uh, as you will? And when you think about the government, it conducts an awful amount of transactions from sort of, um, you know, renewing driver's licenses to, um, to collecting taxes. Um, so we wanted to know just how many transactions does government conduct? Um, and our research found that within the UK central government conducts approximately a billion citizen facing transactions per year. Uh, in the provision of around 400 services. Now, a billion is a huge number. And out of those transactions, um, you know, what you usually have is, you know, a decision process that has a lot of tasks in between. So when you think about, you know, you're renewing a driver's license, that renewal is made up of a, of a process of like a ton of micro decisions that go into it. And what we thought about is, you know, rather than, you know, going for those sort of like high risk AI applications, why don't we just use it to automate some of those like micro decisions um, uh, in this chain of, of um, you know, transaction completion? Um, so our study indeed found that out of this huge amount of billion transactions that the central government conducts, this doesn't include local, local authorities. Approximately 143 million are what we call complex repetitive transactions. And yeah, as you said, we estimate that 84% of these uh, repetitive transactions are highly automatable and represent a huge potential opportunity, you know, saving even an average of just one minute per complex transaction would save the equivalent of approximately 1,200 person year support every year. So, you know, that's, that's massive. And that's not high risk, you know, we're not talking about some like, you know, wild use of AI. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree. Making those micro changes as opposed to falling into this trap of using like this buzzword AI idea will definitely help in the long term, especially in government where things are so slow. Um, speaking of which, Georgina, it'd be great to hear more about the procurement processes that actually happen within government and whether you think that it's set up for agile development. Oh, yeah, <laughs> could have a whole <laughs> session talking about um, procurement, I guess. Um, Yes and, and no, I think not many, uh, you know, not many of the frameworks are focused on actually taking that outcome first approach or, you know, enabling innovation, you know, appreciate there's kind of the Sparks framework. Um, I guess something I appreciate today's session is looking at AI, but I'm always very conscious that we shouldn't get too carried away focusing on a specific technology, but actually, you know, what's the you know the problem the outcome the public sector organization is trying to to solve and then bring in the technology and i think that's the problem often with procurement processes they're not agile enough to allow um i guess to you know have that outcome first approach to them um, but also to embed innovation within them. I think we've seen some great things happening at a local level with Bradford Council. They've added in some innovation clauses to enable to kind of, you know, 
future proof, the future of that solution to enable them to be, you know, agile um, and iterate there. But I think often, you know, with the various kind of frameworks, it it doesn't often lend itself to, um, yeah, to kind of innovation or agile um, procedures. So I think it's kind of a, a, a mixture, but overall, I probably have a lot more to say in terms of actually how do we rethink and reframe um, the way public sector does um, procurement, because I think if we can get that right, we can cre- can create the you know conditions for innovation to thrive and to enable public sector organisations to I guess make the most out of their technologies, whether it's AI, because I think procuring the technology is often the easy bit. But it's how do we make sure not just the digital IT leads, but the heads of services, the frontline officers are brought into that journey to, to make the most of it. So it's not, you know, just sitting there redundant and becoming the legacy of the, the future. Yeah, and, and that's a great point, actually, speaking more broadly to digital transformation as opposed to just specifically AI. Um, and actually, Dave, I know that you have experience at both the MOJ and the Home Office where you were part of that digital transformation of those services. So it'd be great to hear uh, your experience on that. Um, and also, maybe you could touch upon the, um, the issue at the moment, which I think a lot of government does face, which is trying to integrate modern technology with legacy IT systems. You know, how can we address the technical debt that they, debt that they pose? No, absolutely. I mean, uh, two two big questions there. So the um, the I mean, to touch briefly on the experience. Uh, so the MOJ that was where I was a chief technology officer, um, and uh, my experience there was it was around seven years, going from kind of the early days of government digital through to, I guess, the kind of well, seven years later. It's hard to say how you know where where that maturity journey and growth of digital will go in the future. Um, and it was, I mean, it re- if there was, if the, the, the biggest revolution, I think, during that period was the skills of the people that work for government. Um, I think there were so many other things, you know, that that that, that will feel more tangible to, to citizens around transformed services. You know, we put whole new services online. We made services easier. We made services more accessible. Um, and some of these were in, you know, some of the most kind of sensitive um, areas of people's lives, you know, like criminal justice, but also kind of family justice. Um, And, and, you know, you could see the kind of real impact that that was having on people's lives. But I do think the kind of the the most tangible as a kind of civil servant was seeing that kind of change in the skills of the people that worked in inside as civil servants in the Ministry of Justice. So you've got, you know, it's pretty routine now to see designers, data scientists, uh, technical architects, security engineers, uh, and then also like almost like entirely new skill spaces emerging around the intersection of very traditional government work in say policy and uh, you know user centered design thinking. You're seeing real kind of fusion of skills as well. Um, now, your second question was about legacy. Um, as a chief technology officer, I, I really went on a kind of journey. I think the early stage of my journey, I was part of, I was leading teams that were making entirely new software systems to build online services. So things um, things like um, applying for an online lasting power of attorney. Um, and that was bringing, you know, bringing all those kind of new skills into government. I used to work in, in kind of the media industry, bringing kind of ideas from there. Um, and then we went through a mid-maturity phase where we started to notice that all the things we produced created this burden that we had to deal with alongside the, the, the relentless desire to digitize new parts of the justice system. And we were like, this is, okay, we've got more plates spinning here. And then as I moved into a leadership role in CTO, more and more is revealed to me of 20, 30 years of the same impact the previous generations, typically outsourced, but you still ultimately the MOJ inherits most of it, more and more of this aging technology. Uh, And MOJ has technology stretching back easily 30 years and some government departments easily, easily 40 years. And, And then you start, then I started to see the pattern and the pattern was, I, I don't think that the public sector, and I'm now increasingly thinking this is true of the private sector, has really got its head around how to sustainably work with these technologies. And I think that's going to be really acute for AI. 
Um, it's, a key, it's definitely true of software, large data systems, but AI, you've got to start asking yourself the question, who's going to be retraining these models in 20 years? Who's going to be like looking forensically, looking through your supply chain to check the legalities and ethics of, of what you've produced? Because um, we all get very excited about what can first be produced in a prototype, but in government, the services stick around. You know, we've we've been running divorce in the Ministry of Justice since Henry VIII's time, and and it's going to carry <laughs> on right through into the into the future. So. Yeah, no, it's it's a really good point, actually, when you think about how much compute power, how much time it takes to actually build models as well. Just thinking about retraining them, I don't even want to think about it, to be honest. Um, and moving more onto the policy and regulation side, I know that we have this national AI strategy um, currently operating, but um, there was a recent report done by the National Audit Office, which actually found that um, the strategy lacked any kind of coherent plan, uh, particularly in terms of accountability and also leadership of initiatives. Um, so it'd be great to hear, and this is kind of asking all three of you really, um, what role you believe government can actually play in either the facilitation or even the hindrance of adoption of AI technology? Um, maybe Cosmina, you can start us off. Sure. Um, look, I mean, we absolutely know that AI needs to be regulated. Um, so it's not a question of, of if we, we know that. Um, we also know that it is incredibly hard uh, to, 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 to regulate. Um, we don't really have a clear path forward. Now, what we have over the past few years, and I'm not talking just about public sector use, but, but in general, what we have is some of the brightest minds in the world have been thinking about how to regulate AI. And what's really exciting about this particular period of time is that some of those efforts are coming online. And so we're starting to see some of the first efforts, um, you know, bite as it were. So the EU AI Act is about to become a reality. It will become a reality in probably um, two months time. Um, that will teach us an awful lot um, about uh, implementation. It will teach us, an, uh, you know, even if you have a sort of hefty piece of legislation imposed, how are you going to make sure that it actually gets implemented properly? It will teach us an awful lot about the economic consequences of us trying to regulate those technologies, um, which we don't actually know anything about. It will also teach us an awful lot about international convergence um, and whether we're going to be able to agree on anything internationally uh, or, or, or not, and who's going to side, side with whom in this great new world of ours. Now, there are a ton of national level and multinational initiatives in this space. Um, the UK uh, is taking a sort of more wait, wait and see uh, approach, it's not legislating at the moment. Um, and so we had a government uh, response um, to the consultation uh, on the regulation white paper. It is going, the UK is going for a risk-based principles approach. Um, what that will mean in, in practice? Well, we'll have to see. We, we don't actually know yet. Again, sort of the implementation side that will be really interesting to uh, to, to figure out. Um, if you look at the, you know, the UK is also relying to choosing to rely on its um, existing regulators, which you know, is is sound to some extent. Um, you definitely want the sectoral level expertise, and the UK's regulators are brilliant in so many ways. So you don't want to throw that away, um, but you do need some sort of centralized function to bring everything together. And when you think about the implementation challenges. Within the UK, we don't actually know how many regulators there are. And this isn't some like closely guarded state secret. It's just such a complex environment that we honestly do not know. And if anybody's looking for a research topic with high policy impact, map the regulatory <laughs> landscape because everybody's asking for it. So we, have, we know that there are over a hundred. And some of them have highly complex skills. Um, you know, like big regulators like Ofcom have really impressive data science uh, capacities. You know, some regulators have more than a thousand employees. Some regulators are just a one person show that sits at home somewhere in some part of the country, right? So getting everyone to work together is gonna be, is gonna be a challenge. Um, but obviously the more clarity we have, you know, when you ask the citizens of this country, they say they want AI regulation. When we talk to businesses, a lot of them say that you know one of the biggest barriers of adoption is unclarity about the future of, of regulation. 
Um, and even when you talk to the public sector um, itself, sometimes they say, should I invest in this AI system that I, I might not be able to use in the future? So, you know, you need regulation to build trust and to provide clarity on what is and what isn't allowed. Um, but um, the last thing that I want to add as far as the public sector is concerned is that it does have, uh, you know, some very solid foundations, at least for the ethical use of these technologies in a public sector context. And back in 2019, we worked with the Office for AI to create um, public sector guidance for the use of, uh, of AI. Um, and that is now the most heavily downloaded and the most cited guidance in, in the world. So, you know, it does have good things to build on this, this country, um, but it just needs dedicated people to sort of follow those things through. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm very pro UK uh, with the AI approach at the moment. So, um, yeah, I think it's got real potential to be a powerhouse when it comes to its AI output. Um, Georgina, what do you think? Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I must admit, so I've got a colleague who's probably more well versed in me on all things regulation. So actually recognising the importance of this recently appointed someone. Um, yeah, yeah, to look at that. But I guess where I can come at it from in terms of your question Nisha, around what, you know, is the role of government in this? And I think um, they can definitely help by, you know, showing, you know, what does good look like? So we've got the uh, CDDO, uh, I think Central Office for Data. I've forgotten what the rest of the acronym means. <laughs> the Centre for Digital Office. Data Office. <laughs> you at the Cabinet Office, who I know have already done some work on this and looking at kind of best practice around generative um, AI. So I think the opportunity just to share best practice to help scale things up is really important. Obviously, it sounds like common sense, but often when I speak to public sector you know, they're crying out for that. They don't know what others down, you know, across the other boundary or down the road are, are doing. So I think if there is that collective place to to showcase um, what is possible, but the other is really there, the government's role in happy, in, a, in actually helping to close the AI skills gap as well and helping to prepare public sector. What actually, what are the, you know, the jobs of the future? What do they look like now? Um, so whether it's kind of providing funding or specific training courses to help public sector bodies to invest in that now so they're not kind of caught out in the in the future because appreciate you know some roles or part of the roles might be kind of um, automated but it doesn't mean you know the head count within an organization may necessarily go down maybe it's that opportunity to retrain upskill um, to allow others um, you know to be in a new role and I guess you know how can we keep our public sector motivated and attract talent so I think that's another aspect um, to this I guess that's where we see the role of government in terms of I guess that kind of convener best practice attack helping to tackle the the skill shortage. Yeah, I mean, you touch on a, a really interesting point. And actually, um, the report done by the National Audit Office when looking at the um, AI adoption in general, I think it reported that 70% of government bodies um, all agreed that that was a key barrier to AI adoption was a lack of skill set and AI literacy. Um, and actually, the Australian government have just uh, signed a partnership with Microsoft to upskill around 7,000 government staff just to use Copilot. Um, so, you know, measures like that can really help in trying to get government officials really comfortable with AI. Um, Dave, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that and also um, go back to the original question of what role you think government uh, can play in AI adoption. Yeah, I, uh, so I'll answer the, uh, the the previous question first. I think, um, I mean, really just to con concur with everything Kasmina and, and Georgia have said, um, but maybe kind of add, Georgina, sorry, and but add, add something on top and say, I, I do think I do think that we need genuine political leadership on this as well. Um, that I can now say as a non-civil servant, I, that it feels quite absent to me. Um, I think really good legislation and in, in regulation in this area will be consequential. That there are going to be losers, there are going to be changes, there are going to be things that really kind of get quite crunchy. Um, I don't see any of that crunchiness at the moment. Um, I don't see I don't see a kind of willingness to kind of accept the consequences of some of this stuff, and it's. I think it's tricky because I do think you're it's a balancing act between 
wanting to appear pro innovation, you know, pro change, you know, embracing of modernity. But at the same time, we we absolutely have not regulated the internet effectively. Um, subtract AI from the internet, which you can't do, but let's imagine you could. Like it's not an effectively regulated space, and there's a lot of harms emerging from the internet that we're trying to grapple with. You know, online harms, but etc. Um, so I think. I, I do think we need, a, on top of all those things, we do need that genuine political leadership um, to kind of navigate us through this through this kind of period. Um, now you might have to remind me of your second question. <laughs> uh, it was to do with AI literacy and what we can kind of do to encourage more confidence and understanding with using AI in, in government. I mean, a lot, a lot of the a lot of the kind of a, I mean, I, I work with a lot of uh, kind of senior civil servants, executive teams in private sector companies, and a lot of the education I do, I would describe as demystification, which is basically trying to say that, that there are magical qualities to this technology if you step back. But if you step forward and look at it, it and, and and like lift a few of the lids and ask a few awkward questions, it's it's surprisingly kind of wonky you can see the moving parts and I, and I really want people to kind of lean in and see those moving parts see the wonkiness and go right, okay that's what that technology is like it's not it's different to other technologies it's it's got its imperfections and it's got its magic qualities um and I think just getting people to kind of like you know get behind the hype and 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 demystify it for themselves um is probably more important than a kind of um almost like a syllabus or a curriculum of like, you know, here are all, here's the terminology, here are the basics. It's, it's getting people to kind of change their attitude to the technology, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and it looks like we've got a question from the audience. So I'll go ahead and ask that. Uh, in implementing AI in this way, how will government staff members need to be upskilled to support users effectively? what could be a timeline for this training? Uh, so I don't know if, uh, Dave, you want to start with that one and then maybe Georgina and Cosmina can weigh in as well. Yeah, I mean, I mean, as Georgina was pointing out, there are so many different AIs that like this, this, this question could talk to a number of different scenarios. Um, I think, I mean, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk to like a quite a commonly imagined government service around AI, which is which is the chatbot. So government is wildly compl wildly complicated, but a lot of people need to try and understand it. Like people want to know, like what child benefit can I get? What do I need to do this year with my tax? Um, and there's a lot of talk around like you know making government services more accessible by taking this vast amount of inf complex information the government has and holds. Um, and kind of distilling that down, summarizing it, um, uh, using the kind of power of kind of interpreting language and, and getting that information to people quicker. Um, how government staff as owners need to be upskilled to support users effectively? I think, I think if we're talking about people working directly with users, um, so citizens in this case, I guess, um, for me, there's something we really, really have to deal with the the kind of the the whatever it is, the one percent or the five percent in which AI is probably consistently going to keep get, getting getting things wrong, inaccuracies, hallucinations, stuff that draws upon the wrong material or it's out of date or, or that that kind of thing. I don't want that one percent or five percent, whatever it is, depends on the scenario, to undermine the value that you might get from the other ninety five. But it does mean that you can't have government staff members kind of selling these kind of AI products to citizens as this thing will answer all your task questions, you can totally rely on it. Um, it's like it needs to get the right framing and the right positioning. And, and I think there's there's roles there for like content designers, user researchers, people who can really get under the kind of mindset of what does it feel like to interact with this technology as a citizen? What mistakes are likely to happen? Um, so what would be a timeline for that training? I think that's I think my answer was too abstract to be able to <laughs> lay a timeline on top of that. So, so I, I'm going to bypass that one. 
Sure, no, no worries, Dave. Um, but yeah, I think it really does speak to trying to strike that right balance between AI risk and also AI opportunity, and then the public perception of that use within uh, the public sector. Uh, Cosmina, do you have any thoughts you'd like to weigh in on this question? Yeah, so I mean, it's something that we get approached for a lot at the Turing, and we have um, been giving it a lot of thought. Um, we basically came up with an almost like AI readiness framework um, to try to understand how ready is an organization uh, to, how, how AI ready is it? Um, and readiness has three components when you think about it. One is individual level readiness, which is, you know, do the individual people have the right skills? And here it's important to know that, you know, we're not looking, we're not talking about AI specialists. There's no such thing as an AI specialist. You know, you need so many different disciplines and professions to feed into those systems to make sure that they are what they are, what they're supposed to be. There's also organization level readiness when we talk about AI. And that sort of answers questions such as, are leaders supportive of those technologies? Do they understand the risks and opportunities and limits um, and limitations? And that's a different, um, it's a very different type of readiness uh, than individual re uh, level readiness. And finally, you also have system re uh, level readiness, which is, you know, is the system as the whole ready for the adoption of these technologies? You know, are there the right governance frameworks in place? Are there the right sort of, you know, um, sharing mechanisms in place where they, they are about data models or sort of lessons learned? Um, and building all of those three levels of readiness, and you do need all, of, all three of them, takes a long time uh, and uh, it's a very sort of different um, proposition building an individual skills from building an organizational culture and a system level readiness. Yeah, but it's an interesting way to look at it actually, to break it down into those three kind of salient components. Um, Georgina, do you have any thoughts you'd like to add? Yeah, I think, yeah, agree with what Dave and Kasmina said. And I think building on what Kasmina said in terms of those different aspects of readiness, I think it's really seeing AI as that opportunity for public sector organisations, I guess, to get their house in order when it comes to digital transformation, because we can't just do one thing in siloed for AI. You know, we need to fix the plumbing for, you know, whatever technology, uh, you know, an organization might need to procure because if it's not interoperable or actually doesn't need to use a need then you know it's a bit redundant so it goes back to the basics in terms of you know the culture you know our colleagues and the workforce and power to think differently do things differently you know not just when it comes to um ai so i think it's kind of yeah let's take this, you know, while there is this excitement around AI, let's not just look at it within its silo. I appreciate there are certain things that we have to consider in terms of, you know, potential risk, but actually what's that bigger, uh, you know, bigger opportunity for public sector organisations to do things um, differently, especially at that local government level with, you know, the various financial challenges that they're facing. And then I guess back to the question, um, around upskilling staff I would also say you know it definitely takes an ecosystem approach and don't forget about you know your suppliers whether that's existing partners or are you about to you know procure something you know ask those questions um you know how can your supplier actually help you you know deliver you know on the solution you know beyond just you know we've procured it and that's it but you know getting them into kind of support and invest in training, you know, alongside any other kind of government initiatives as well. So I think it goes back to government and public sector being that savvy and smart buyer um, as well. So again, it just goes back to that digital readiness and knowing, you know, what to ask and actually ultimately, you know, what's the outcome that you're trying to achieve um, with this. Yeah, I mean, it really does speak to this whole shift in mindset that needs to take place. And can you really put a timeline on that shift? <laughs> Probably not. Probably should have started already, yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so going back, I know we had mentioned a little bit about building public trust, and it'd be great to hear 
what kind of strategies we can actually put in place today to continue building that public trust with using AI systems, particularly in sensitive areas like healthcare uh, or law enforcement. Uh, maybe, Georgina, you want to kick us off on that one? Yeah, it's interesting. I think um, during the pandemic, we saw lots of digital kind of resident panels kind of getting them involved in actually understanding, you know, what are the problems um, that are really facing communities um, and places. So I think we need, you know, a lot more of that um, that transparent, uh, transparency and bringing in residents and citizens, you know, in that decision making process, but also I think demystifying it sounds so simple as what well, kind of uh, Dave's, uh, Dave, you know, highlighted and probably spent lots of our time similar to Tech UK doing the doing the same. So I think it's really that opportunity um, partnering with relevant organisations, you know, across the place within the community, you know, to showcase this is, you know, what's possible. This is actually how we're going about um, mitigating risk, but also applying that as well to organisations as well, especially to the frontline um, staff. Um, I think in the last few months, every other week, I was at a session looking at the role of AI in social care, for example. And I think there was great appetite and excitement to use it, but there's also that fear in terms of, you know, what does it mean for, for you know, for my for my job? But it showed actually there's the opportunity to free up your time so you can actually invest in care but you have to have you have to make that time and space to have those um, conversations, both with public, but also with your, you know, internally within the organisation. But often the challenge is making that time and seeing it as a luxury. So, again, that mindset sh shift saying actually it isn't a luxury. You have to invest in this this space and time to, to future gaze. And I would say, you know, use you know utilize industry supplies if you don't have that headspace to you know understand what's out there they can definitely um help you do that as well and obviously they have lots of user groups um as well so they can help share best practice um or connect you with others that are doing things already yeah i know that that's great um and dave uh would you like to add anything to that yeah, I think I would. I would definitely add something about. Um, I, I really, I, I still really believe in the power of transparency um, in in this area. Um, there's there was the kind of slogan that came along with uh, early days government digital service, which was uh, work in the open. Um, and what, one of the things that resulted in at the Ministry of Justice is we kind of open. We've made all our code available online, so any kind of um, service that you were using you could go and inspect how it works like how does it make decisions what does it do what are the moving parts um culturally i i feel like there there's been a little step away from that um and it's still a huge cultural dimension i'd say this is it's to some degree true of healthcare but it's definitely true in policing and and, and many other domains which is there is a there is a, a slightly kind of broken culture of secrecy um so it's my belief, for example, that I think there should be absolute transparency around how decisions are made in policing, what systems they use, what data they use. Um, now, the actual cases and criminal investigations themselves need to have need to be very, very carefully controlled set information sets. But the software around it, like can, you can have immense transparency and with AI, you start to open up this kind of new box of like, well, what's, what does transparency look like on how we, how, what the training data is on these things? And because the training data becomes a crucial part of the decision making. Um, and as, as far as I'm concerned, we have not gone nearly far enough on, on transparency. And I think the UK government is in a great position to be a leader on this. Um, but I think, I think it, it requires a huge kind of collective appetite to push in that direction because culturally inside these organizations, secrecy and protecting information is culturally far stronger than that desire to be transparent and open. Yeah, absolutely. I know transparency is is definitely uh, a hot topic at the moment within the AI space and also whether what degree of transparency we need, whether we actually need explainability as well. Um, so yeah, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. And uh, Cosby, it'd be great to, to hear your thoughts on this. 
Sure. I mean, I totally agree with what Georgina and Dave have uh, said thus far. I just wanted to sort of emphasize the crucial importance of stakeholder engagement when it comes to public trust. Um, and, uh, you know, for us that are sort of building the technologies, um, it doesn't matter how much time we spend on, on our own and talk to our colleagues about, you know, how they should be built and what they should do. Um, ultimately, we learn the most when we go out and we talk to people <laughs> whom those technologies end up affecting. And um, Georgina said earlier that you don't want to be the first local authority that adopts a, a, a technology, and I totally agree with that. Equally, you also don't want to be the last local authority that, that adopts the technology. And somewhere when I started the, the, the Turing in 2018 or 2019, there were a group of local authorities that had adopted the machine learning um, uh, to, to look at children's uh, social care. And a lot of other local authorities felt an awful lot of pressure to purchase the exact same systems. Um, and some of the first questions were, we got were, should we do this? Is it, is it ethical? And um, we wrote a report at the time on the ethics of using machine learning in children's social care. But for that report, we learned the most from the families themselves whose lives were impacted by those systems. Um, and when you talk to them, you realize that actually a lot of their problems don't come from the technology themselves. They come from how the sort of procedures are built. So one of the things that came out in our report, for example, is that you know, the family sort of complained about the fact that the system is very much, the data collection is very much uh, geared at risk. So you collect data on what places a child at risk, but there's no data collection on what are the positive impacts on the child's life. So the fact that there is an adult, like a grandparent, for example, who is a very positive influence on that child's life can overrule a, a lot of those risks, but those were never built in and the technologies are never going to be able to account for these because the data is never collected. You know, there's not a problem with AI. There's the problem with how the system works. Um, and so, yeah, uh, stakeholder engagement is absolute key. And that's where we learn the most. Yeah, definitely. And it also highlights that AI isn't sort of this be all or end all. It is ultimately just another tool that we can use, much like the Internet and other technologies as well. It's just whether we use it in a way that enables or actually inhibits what we're trying to achieve. Um, so now moving forward, it would be great to hear from all three of you again on where you see uh, the UK public sector going in the next 10 years with its use of AI and, and more broadly with technology in general. Um, and also the steps that you think we should take now to prepare for that change. Uh, maybe we can stick with you, Cosmina, we can hear your thoughts first. Yes, I mean, there are two two areas that get me excited. And one of them I talked about, which is the potential for, of those technologies to automate those sort of routine tasks. Um, and this is the low hanging fruit. Uh, and the other bit um, uh, that I haven't mentioned, but I also am highly excited about is that we're so used to thinking about those technologies as um, you know, getting them to do what we can do. And so it's almost like a competition between AI and, and, and human intelligence. Um, and I, I think there's so much to gain if we move away from that and we start thinking about what can AI do that we are not good at, that our human brains are not good at. Um, and one of the things that we're not good at is understanding complex systems. Um, and, and the entire policy world is a complex interdependent system. And we've seen that during COVID. So we had sort of like models that looked at health and then models that looked at the economy. And all the, all the talk was about how, you know, health was health policies were impacting the economy and the other way around. There were no models to actually sort of integrate these two. Um, and I think this is where sort of data science and AI can help. They can help in sort of making sense of those complex interdependent systems so that we understand our economies and societies better and can finally you know, produce policies that help people and have the intended ex effects as opposed to what, what we have these days. So that's that's a dream that I have for <laughs> some years down the line. Yeah, well, it's, it's nice to see the positive in all of this. Um, Georgina, do you have any thoughts then on where you think the sector will be going in the next 10 years? Yeah, I think definitely. I think public sector can definitely 
be yeah be that leader um and that center of excellence for ai definitely within the the uk because there's definitely lots of problems for them to solve and where you know ai and other technologies um you know can help can help do that so you know i guess the optimist in me is actually is this an opportunity to you know do things differently um you know work smarter but also kind of motivate the the workforce to you know to do things differently and get them excited so you know expose them to different technologies and to upskill them so we can actually you know retain that talent within the public sector because we know it's a, a big challenge so I guess ultimately you know public sector is that desired place to to work and can compete with the the private sector because they are working on so many different you know challenges and, and problems but we're doing so you know in a in an environment where you know innovation is flourishing i guess that's the you know the vision and the dream <laughs> Love obviously it. in a safe and secure way of course have to caveat that <laughs> of course <laughs> uh and finally dave i might go i might go for a uh pessimistic optimistic joint <laughs> joint answer because because I need to get the pessimistic out of my system um like the the the, pes the pessimist in me says like there are genuine risks that things become less transparent that more and more of the technology supply chain uh kind of goes into big tech companies a AI just becomes a, a very very opaque magical technology that that kind of you know does a lot of things, but 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 kind of reduces that kind of accountability and transparency and public engagement, undermines democracy, undermines our government services. Um, like there there is a there is a kind of negative path for artificial artificial technology in the public sector and more widely. Um, the optimistic version. So the optimistic <laughs> version for me would be, um, I. I genuinely think like eventually like AI has it has the potential to make work far more interesting for lots and lots of people. Um, because I, I think AI at its best does really, really boring things. Um, you know, it 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 does stuff like kind of fishing through like hundreds of thousands of documents just trying to get like an email address out of it or something like that. Or it kind of just listens to hours and hours and hours and hours of audio and then tells you what people are saying. Like by by one lens, those if a human is asked to do those things, they can be quite boring. So there's a real potential for for work to just get more interesting. And at the public value of that is not just that the work's more interesting, but it's that it's that the, the work that people do, do is more human. Um, and I think I think it's a book by I think it's a James Plunkett book, End State or something, where he talks about this idea that. A lot of people do actually aspire to have a society where the most highly valued work is the most human work, where, you know, there are areas in like kind of nursing and social care where automation just doesn't make sense. Like the, the very value of the work is in the human interaction. Um, and I think the, the what AI could achieve is to make more and more people able to do that rich, interesting, very, very human work. Well, thank you for ending on the positive rather than the pessimistic view, Dave. Um, so I'm conscious of time, so I think we're going to have to wrap up now. Um, I just want to close by extending my thanks to both the wonderful panellists for their time this afternoon and also to the audience for participating in today's discussion. Uh, we've explored the current regime and also examined what policy and regulation can do to support AI uptake in the public sector. Hopefully we can carry this forward into our own research and work, realising AI potential in a way that transforms the public sector. If anyone wants to discuss this further, then please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or via email. Thanks, everyone, and take care. <laughs>